The International Space Station is without question the jewel in the crown of low Earth orbit. Observation post, research lab and classroom all in one. But many other assets orbiting Earth are even more important to our everyday lives, delivering communications, weather observation, global positioning and resource management. And the list is growing every year. Chances are you are watching this program by a satellite in one way or another, either transmitted directly or indirectly to your television, iPad, laptop or phone. In other words, you're using technology once considered science fiction. Pushing the envelope, technology must keep up with demand. More data, more reliability and real-time connection. Space test and hardware and technology are on the cutting edge of science, often introducing new methods of gathering scientific information. Demonstrator missions are regularly sent up, flying new engineering solutions to prove the hardware in situ, even without a specific goal in mind. Technology goes through our whole development cycle, which we call the seamless chain of innovation. We start from the idea and we work along to develop it through our work in the labs, through the work of industry, and especially of small and medium industries, which are the vectors of innovation. But at the end, you need to prove that it works in the real place, space. And in order to do that, uh, we use this missions that can take the risk of flying unproven technology and demonstrate to the larger missions that they work. Research laboratories focusing on the next generation of space hardware are dotted around the globe. The UK's Space Gateway Harwell Campus, the ESA RAL Advanced Manufacturing Laboratory, supports cutting edge research and development. The purpose of the laboratory is basically to assess and pre-screen candidate materials and processes for future space missions. So this will guide ESA as well as the space community in focusing their technology investments in the right area. The lab has extensive on-site testing facilities, such as the ISIS neutron source, the diamond light source synchrotron, and the UK's central laser facility. This year will bring the first launch of a satellite using the small geo platform, Hispasat 36W1. Small Geo, a telecommunications platform accommodating a wide range of payloads and missions, has been developed in Germany in a public-private partnership between ESA, OHB and the operator Hispasat. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. because ISPASAT and ESA were able to join forces that we were able to develop a satellite with such a level of innovation. On the one hand, a, a new platform with a new satellite prime contractor. On the other hand, a, a, a payload embarking also a high level of innovation. And altogether, this satellite is, uh, is, has been developed 
is being is going to be flown and and we provide uh, very innovative services so end to end the the level of innovation is uh, is very high and it, indeed separately neither is passat nor risa would have been able to undertake such a complex development with a small geo what we we have uh, tried to achieve was really to develop a new product in the low end of the telecommunication market. And at the same time, this new product would allow uh, the, a new prime contractor to become a prominent player of the satellite telecommunication market. That's uh, the OHP, which is the prime contractor of this uh, satellite. This is a class of satellites that uh, only have electric propulsion on board, which is a high efficient system that allows achieving important mass savings. So we are able to put in space a satellite with a similar capacity of a full chemical one but with much lower mass which means less launcher cost, compatibility with more launch vehicles and again this translates in advantages for the operators who have at their disposal more efficient technical solutions for their mission. But it's a very flexible so it can also be used for other geostationary applications. Another scheduled event in the telecom area is the launch of EDRSC, expected by the end of the year. EDRSC is also based on the small geo platform and will be the first dedicated satellite for EDRS, the European Data Relay Service. It will be the second element of the Laser Relay Space Data Highway. Low Earth satellites encumbered with line of sight communications can beam their data upward to geosynchronous satellites via laser, which can then transmit the signal to ground stations at any time. The Small Geo program is, is just the first step for OHB. OHB has already sold a number of other telecommunication satellites, and indeed this is the start of a product line that will evolve over time like any other product lines of the other prime contractors operating in the satellite telecom market. Another area of research has been in cost and time effectiveness in developing satellites. This has led to the CubeSat, several of which have flown in space. Measuring just 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, these small cubes or nanosatellites have become extremely popular, opening up new possibilities for a wide range of groups previously unable to access space. We are a small group of uh, students with two professors and two coordinators and uh, we had 52 uh, students who did the master's thesis on this project. Uh, it's a great project for the students because uh, it's the occasion to apply uh, practical stuff and not only the theoretical stuff they have learned at school. Our satellite is uh, the telecommunication satellite. We use the D-STAR protocol for the radio amateurs to communicate around the world. This is really a special moment when we can see that finally the people is installed on the platform that uh, uh, will carry it to space on board the Soyuz launcher. So it's a great feeling to be here in Kourou, in French Guiana, with the satellite almost in space and normally ready to work. Using off-the-shelf technology, CubeSats have been launched from the ISS and piggybacked onto other satellite launches. They will soon be deployed to Mars, asteroids and further afield. GPS is used every day by people on the ground thanks to global positioning satellites from the United States. But GPS is not the only system in orbit. Russia has its GLONASS constellation, 
China has its own Beidou system, and Europe is building the Galileo network. The initial services is a stage in the program whereby there is sufficient infrastructure is made available in space, satellites around the globe who circle around, uh, plus infrastructure on the ground which uh, control the satellites, provide the navigation signals. Um, enough of that infrastructure is ready so that uh, the system can be used. The use is still uh, not fully 100%, hence the word initial services. These constellations are not exclusive. Galileo will also use the GPS system for even more accuracy, and the US is tying in with the Russian GLONASS for extraterrestrial services. In other words, they will enable spacecraft to utilize the positioning system in almost any orbit around the Earth. Some of the signals are available only during uh, a certain percentage of the day. Uh, the satellites move around and not all of the day you have sufficient satellites inside. Um, but there is enough to start. And uh, this is a very important moment in the program, an excessively important moment because this actually uh, shows to the world that the system is, uh, is really going well. Uh, the performance uh, we actually can provide, we know, is, is excellent. And of course we will continue building out the full constellation, but the users can actually now uh, start using um, the satellite system. The European Galileo navigation system is nearing completion. More satellites will be launched this year, adding to a constellation which will eventually number 22. Under initial services, um, there will be three services provided. One is the so-called open service. This is for the mass market. This is where people will use their smartphones, their uh, navigation devices in cars, which will um, have Galileo enabled chips inside, inside, which will receive both Galileo and GPS in combination, and it is the combination of the two systems which will be used to determine the position of the user. For ESA and the European Commission, when we started with satellite navigation, it was of course uh, not quite clear how really important satellite navigation was going to be. And we had uh, studies, we had our insights in it, and we knew that it, was, uh, it, was be, it would be important. Uh, but now we really see how important it is, particularly looking in the future where we're going uh, to we're gonna need to have uh, a sufficiently developed um, satellite navigation infrastructure to support autonomous driving and all sorts of other applications. NASA has already developed specialized GPS receivers for space application. The navigator receiver from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center first flew in 2009 and proved to be very successful. A number of future missions in HEO, GEO and MEO plan to work with this receiver using its high sensitivity signal acquisition and tracking capabilities. NASA's JPL has also developed the Blackjack Flight GPS. Now being flown aboard an Argentine satellite, the system looks at how the GPS radio signal is distorted or delayed along its path. A typical GPS signal can plot a position to within around 22 yards. Blackjack can pinpoint its host satellite continuously to an accuracy of about one inch. 18 receivers are on orbit, while another system under development called the Triple GNSS or Tri-G will be able to track GPS and GNSS signals, including the Russian GNSS and European Galileo navigation constellations. Our spacefaring nations continue their Earth observation work in collaboration with a number of organizations. The refinement of orbital positioning and unhindered high-speed communications mean more new technologies craft are being added to the armada of observation satellites.
They include Europe's Copernicus program with no fewer than three Sentinel satellite launches. In March, Sentinel-2B will be launched carrying a wide swathe high-definition multispectral imager. With Sentinel-2A already on orbit, both Sentinel-2 satellites will monitor land cover, vegetation and water pollution. Now that we get Sentinel-2B to fly together with Sentinel-2A, there's a couple of improvements that we get so far. We have a revisit of 10 days. With Sentinel-2B, we will have a revisit of five days. That means we see every spot on Earth every five days. That will help, of course, also to avoid the clouds or to have the chances higher to have no clouds in the various regions of the world. Uh, both together, Sentinel-2A and 2B, will also improve the performance of the services that are using the data. Sentinel-2B is uh, contributing to a constellation of uh, Sentinel satellites, which really provides data over decades uh, for, of, in different uh, uh, domains and with different instruments on board. So therefore, we're building up a fully operational system, which is uh, enough incentive for industry to invest and to, to rely on this information in the future. Sentinel-2A is already supporting a lot of applications. They're ranging from, for example, agricultural applications where we can do yield forecast to uh, forest monitoring where we, for example, see deforestation. And uh, besides that, there's plenty of other applications like inland water where we can look at the quality of the, of the water. We can support river monitoring, but also uh, co um, coastal areas where we look at the um, changes in the coastal regions. On top of that, we recently changed uh, also to acquire the Antarctic region, so we're also now looking at ice and glaciers. Later in the year, two more Sentinels, Sentinel-5P and Sentinel-3B, will follow. The Sentinel-5 precursor mission is a satellite dedicated to monitoring our atmosphere at a high temporal and spectral resolution. It also offers increased cloud-free observation. A second satellite, which is a replica of the first one, is of course shorter uh, to develop and to test. Uh, the, the main effort when you develop a new system is put on the first spacecraft, where you discover basically all the early problems uh, in uh, equipment production, software validation, integration and test. All the specifications, plans, uh, test procedures are ready whenever you start building your second spacecraft. This is, of course, a large benefit. The second spacecraft, let's say, was uh, realized in one and a half year time. Uh, the cost, as well, of course, of a recurring spacecraft is much cheaper than a proto-flight spacecraft. You could say, basically, it's 50% of the price of the first one. Sentinel-3B is a multi-instrument mission to measure sea surface topography, sea and land surface temperature, and ocean and land color. We are addressing uh, uh, a number of issues that relate to the development of new science, but also operational missions. For example, Earth Explorer missions, the scientific missions, but also we are preparing the next generation of Sentinel missions for Copernicus. In the next five to ten years in Earth observation, we will face a number of challenges, some of them coming from outside. Big data, constellations, commercial companies entering our domain. And I think there we really have to see, as ESA, as European Space Agency, a public institution, how we can best react to these external challenges and position ourselves with our programs to, to really address these challenges from our perspective. Demonstrating new laser technology, ESA is launching the ADM Aeolus satellite. ADM stands for Atmospheric Dynamics Mission. It will provide global observation of wind profiles. With this mission, ESA hopes to further our knowledge of the Earth's atmosphere and weather systems. Space is a hazardous place. A key part of maintaining reliable satellite services is keeping a weather eye out.
the Earth is constantly being bombarded by damaging solar storms and charged particles ejected from the Sun. These could knock out satellites and even communication systems and power grids on the ground. Geomagnetic storms, solar X-ray and proton flux, coronal mass ejections and sunspots, all are monitored continuously. The Earth is also surrounded by a cloud of debris from 60 years of human space activities, space junk which could also damage satellites. Near-Earth objects also threaten the Earth and could collide with our planet. All these threats are monitored under ESA's Space Situational Awareness Program, which the Operations Directorate hopes to see continuing to evolve. to protect our assets in orbit and on Earth against impacts from space, uh, may it be from space weather or uh, risks from near-Earth objects. And uh, we also want to protect our spacecraft in orbit uh, from risk, for example, coming from space debris. The Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, or IADC, is a forum of 14 nations brought together to exchange information and to research various aspects of this problem. Numerous working groups are studying methods of protection and threat mitigation. No matter what hardware is orbiting Earth, it can only make scientific observations. Only our human perception of the beauty that lies below can help us fully appreciate the planet we call home. Our seafaring nature has translated well to the space age, sailing out into the unknown in search of riches of one kind or another. While Europe and Asia continue their interest in the resource-rich moon, the United States and NASA have set their sights on nothing less than manned missions to Mars. Can they manage to go shore to shore on the most dangerous of unknown seas, deep space?
With low Earth orbit harnessed, it's time to look further afield. To build a spacecraft and rocket system to reach Mars is a mammoth undertaking, but if successful, it will return the United States to the top of the space achievement ladder. The first requirement? A space capsule able to carry six astronauts for a long period of time and return them safely to Earth. Orion is its name, and it has flown once already in a shakedown. The next flight will be an unmanned test mission past the moon, followed by a third manned mission. The components for the vehicle are developed around the country, tested and checked, then passed on for assembly. The minutest bolt and circuit is designed, tested, redesigned and tested again. Slowly, the systems come together with the aid of some breakthrough technology, particularly in manufacturing methods, new materials and processes. The first thing to notice is that NASA have gone back to the classic conic shape like Apollo, the safest design yet devised. Avionics, control systems, computer software and a glass cockpit, all state of the art. And the concept was to go with a glass cockpit. And what that means is that the instruments are all images on a computer screen. They are all on the glass. So rather than flipping a physical switch, the crew brings up a computer screen and flips a virtual switch, a little icon of a switch or icon of a valve. And with the exception of seven panels right around the computer screens, which have about 60 switches, that is all of the cockpit of Orion happens on the glass. One big benefit is a weight savings because you don't have to have a physical switch. And having a physical switch, not only is there the weight of the switch, but you also have the weight of the wire to the switch. And you have to have the weight of circuitry that takes that wire and feeds it into the vehicle computers. Because of Orion's size, its all-important heat shield is the largest one ever made, and new processes were required to manufacture it. The Orion heat shield has got to be able to withstand uh, landing loads on the order of 300 to 400,000 pounds. Because we're returning potentially from the moon or beyond, and the flight duration from the time in which you commit to a return to the time you actually land, the weather conditions on Earth can be substantially different or difficult to predict. And so the Orion spacecraft has to be able to land in the ocean in a wide range of sea conditions, wave height, uh, wave slope angle, and horizontal winds. That is what's driven us to a skin stringer architecture that utilizes a thick laminate uh, composite skin bolted to a titanium substructure. We bond on an ablator called the Avcoat. The ablator is the thermal protection part of the, of the heat shield. The very outside of the ablator actually gets hot enough that it decomposes, and that's the ablation part of it as opposed to an insulator like a shuttle tile. Then come the ancillary structures and equipment that will ride with the capsule. The escape tower, designed and tested, will pull the capsule away from the main rocket in the case of an emergency. Adapter separation from the rocket's upper stage. Parachute deployment. The connecting adapter to the EMS. The EMS is the service module attached to the Orion in flight, supplying oxygen, water, power and heating. Built by ESA, it is based on their very successful ATV program, which delivered supplies to the ISS. It will also provide the main engine thrust for deep space maneuvering. We have, uh, in particular, a very, very tight schedule in front of us. So everybody is working under a high pressure to meet the dates, and this requires a very, very close collaboration. I see a very motivated team, and uh, so far, as an agency, we are quite happy with the performance of the European industry.
US Navy is tasked with retrieving the capsule from the ocean. At first they train in the pool, then calm waters, then the Pacific, and finally the real thing. This is the RS-25, the Ferrari of liquid rocket engines and the main engine from the Space Shuttle program. Economically repurposed for the Space Launch System, four of these engines will power the main stage of the rocket. The main solid rocket boosters of the Shuttle program also have a renewed life in the SLS. With another two segments added, the boosters will thrust for over two minutes. This project has, has been a real fun effort in trying to take a, a heritage booster that had many, many years of reliability and great performance and evolve it into something uh, bigger and better. When we first undertook this design and qualification for the new booster, part of the mission was to make the, the booster uh, more affordable and, and more modern. And of course, it had to be completely redesigned for a new mission. It's a larger booster, and the mission profile is, is sufficiently different to where pretty much everything on the inside of the booster is different. There's well over a thousand individual processes. Working with our customer, we were able to identify several hundred areas of improvement. We've got totally new avionics on, on this vehicle versus what we had on shuttle. It's state of the art. Bigger and more powerful than any previous launch system, the SLS has been under development for some time. Designing it is one thing, building it another. In new or refurbished factories and assembly shops, the body of the largest rocket ever to fly is being constructed one piece at a time. The massive hydrogen tank takes shape. The smaller oxygen tank soon follows. The interim stage for the manned flight is another hydrogen-oxygen motor supplied by cryotanks fabricated with new technologies. So to design and manufacture this tank, we use new materials. We process the tank by automated fiber placement. The benefit of that is we can lay down the material quickly, which provides us a low cost operation and a very lightweight tank. We've worked on this program for 29 months and when we started we'd never built a tank of this size uh, by the, the methods that we did. Uh, we did automated fiber placement and fluted core. Uh, just developing the robotic fiber placement equipment and way to make the skirt in one piece was a large challenge. Each exacting piece is fabricated. Test articles are run through the mill. Vibration tests, vacuum tests, acoustic tests, stress tests. Nothing is left to chance. new technology and new materials for a new generation of space exploration. 
So this test, there were several things that we looked at. This was the first time we used those uh, thermal knives to start the deployment sequence, and that allowed uh, cut some tethers that then allowed the solar array to deploy. Um, we wanted to test the locking mechanisms to ensure that it locked properly in, in space because uh, we, anything that could possibly go wrong, we wanted to see test down here so that we're, we can ensure a, you know, a successful flight. It's all about technology. If you don't uh, develop technologies for the future, you won't you won't go where you want to go. So, so it, composites will decrease the weight of the tanks. It'll increase the payload performance of the launch vehicle. It'll give us. Uh, it, it basically enables things that we don't have today. Soon, the mighty rocket will lift human beings up further than ever before. The flight to Mars will be a long one, too long for a crew to sit in a capsule. Habitat and supplies will also be lifted to orbit and assembled. Several companies have been selected by NASA to carry out studies for a suitable system to do the job. A bit of competition is always good for invention. Bigelow Aerospace, with its expandable activity module, or BEAM, currently being tested on the ISS, will develop and test a prototype of X-Base, a 330 cubic meter expandable habitat. Boeing of Houston is developing a modular habitat system that leverages more than 15 years experience in designing, developing, assembling on orbit, and safely operating the International Space Station. Lockheed Martin will refurbish a multi-purpose logistics module into a full-scale habitat prototype that will include integrated avionics and ECLSS. Orbital ATK will mature the mission architecture and design of their initial cislunar habitat concept based on the Cygnus spacecraft that now supplies the ISS. Sierra Nevada Corporation's space systems will study and refine a flexible architecture and concept of operations for a deep space habitat that draws on the lessons of three to four commercial launches to construct a modular, long-duration habitat. NanoRax, in conjunction with its partners, Space Systems Laurel and the United Launch Alliance, referred to collectively as the Ixion team, will conduct a comprehensive feasibility study regarding the conversion of an existing launch vehicle's upper stage or propellant segment into a pressurized habitable volume in space. So if you're designing spacecraft to be in the Mars orbit, then the studies we're doing on space station can be applied and help us design more durable spacecraft for that Martian atmosphere. MISSI stands for the Materials International Space Station Experiment. We do study the durability of polymers in terms of their mechanical properties with radiation exposure. And we hear a lot about the radiation exposure impact on humans for uh, flights to, say, Mars. But polymers and other materials that are used on spacecraft can also degrade from ra radiation, and that's one of the things I study. Um, the MISSI-8 experiments do take a little bit of time because we do very careful dehydration measurements of the samples after they've been in space. What we found is that the Teflon erosion rate is highly dependent on the amount of sunlight and possibly the heating, too. You need to know which of these environments it's going to be exposed to because it'll erode at a different rate depending on the environment. Assembling spacecraft in orbit and fueling them for the long journey to Mars sounds simple enough. On-orbit refueling is anything but simple. 
NASA have been developing a system for unmanned refueling for quite some time and have a test article on board the ISS. We can take a pick and place robot, put the tool wherever we need it to be, and all it needs to do is drive that tool because the smarts are in the tool. So that's what we learned from working on Hubble is you put a smart tool with the astronauts and accomplish, you know, both things. You've got smart tools and astronauts working together. Now we're putting smart tools with robots and trying to accomplish the same type of things we did on Hubble. Aimed at developing capabilities for servicing, even refueling spacecraft on orbit, RRM is like doing precise surgery at a distance, doctor and patient separated by the void and vacuum of space. It's tough, but the payoff is huge. Robotics uh, uh, can do things that humans can't do uh, in terms of precision, in terms of control. Holding a particular spot for six hours while engineers on the ground debate what to do, we can't ask a human to do that. Um, the robot is a very stiff, rigid interface. It doesn't, it's not forgiving like an astronaut's hand. So we have to take that into account. Um, when you push on something really hard with a robot, you build up really large contact forces. When the astronaut pushes on something, his wrist might give, you know, that's, he's got his own internal sort of software compliance running. Um, but uh, in order to accommodate the robot so we don't break anything, we have to build features into the tool, uh, features into the software, um, just getting the, the robot to go where you want it to go, and, you know, they don't position precisely. So you have to do things like build lead-in into the tool. An astronaut can probably just get it right on there because he's, he's right there. So we do have to do things to make them, you know, very specific to robotic operation. That task successful, next stop, Mars. The first manned mission to Mars will probably only orbit the planet, checking out all the gear and processes, even launching communication satellites and finalizing landing sites in preparation for the next mission, which will then make the descent to the surface. And that has a whole new set of problems to overcome. Unlike the moon, Mars has stronger gravity, about 0.6 of Earth's. But it does have an atmosphere where parachutes can be used, although the atmosphere is very thin and not very deep. Well, it's a funny thing about Mars, but if you take the average of uh, the planet, the average height of everything in the planet, it turns out that most of the north is two kilometers below that and most of the south is two kilometers above that. And uh, it's just, uh, we always land in the north because there's a lot more atmosphere. If we land in the south, it's like four kilometers less of air to come to a stop. In fact, at the altitude of the mountains in the south, the Mars Science Laboratory was still supersonic as it was descending into uh, the crater that it was reaching in the north. Assuming the need to pre-position habitats, supplies and equipment on the surface prior to a human landing, NASA and its partners are looking at several solutions. One is the HIAD, or Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator. This is basically a very large inflatable heat shield, much larger in area than the payload, able to slow the craft considerably faster than a standard spacecraft heat shield. Plans are to test the system on a payload from the ISS, utilizing a Cygnus resupply spacecraft. Once lower in the atmosphere, 
parachutes will further slow the payload to an altitude low enough for rocket engines to take over. Morpheus and the zombie flight systems have matured over the last few years and are capable of delivering cargo to a planet's surface autonomously, avoiding rough terrain or other obstacles without human intervention. yet another building block to our human effort to explore the solar system. <laughs> 